and welcome to a new video! Now, a year and a bit ago I had a brief dip into the waters of Googology, a pseudo-mathematical world of extremely large numbers with extremely silly names, and forging a space fantasy cinematic universe therefrom. Since then I've had overwhelming support for the project, but there's only so much Googology one vegetable can take. However, it recently came to my attention that mathematical hobbyists enjoy not only naming massive numbers, but also massive shapes. That's right, it's Polytope time! <laughs> As lines construct two-dimensional polygons, triangles, squares, pentagons, etc., and polygons construct three-dimensional polyhedra, pyramids, cubes, dodecahedra, etc., mathematically there's nothing stopping polyhedra from constructing four-dimensional polychora, five cells, tesseracts, hyperdodecahedra, etc., and so on and etc. In general, n-1-dimensional polytopes can be cobbled together into new n-dimensional polytopes, and boy howdy are there a lot of them! And when there are a lot of them, there's scope for some real silly names. And so we're going to delve back into the sci-fi wonderland of the Goo Galaxy and explore the characters of the inevitable prequel films, since as exotic as they are, nothing innumerable about these shapes comes even close to Googleological in scale. Since enthusiasts tend to categorise the polytopes into armies and regiments, not sure why, maybe because they're uniform, I am most pleased to introduce you to Goo Galaxy, the Polytope Wars. We begin, perfectly reasonably, with our protagonist, with the rather snazzy name of Sansips Dextux. Yes, I'm rather fond of that name, can't think why. Anywho, Sansips is a brooding warrior with a checkered past. Scarred, but capable. They could take on anything, but choose not to. They know not their true, insurmountable strength, because they're wholly engaged with brooding over their tumultuous, troubled upbringing and... Sorry, hang on. Yeah? Hello. Hey, Hazel, what's going on? There's something you need to look uh, at. Sure, hey, let me see. Uh, Just there. Uh, sure, okay. Who is Mary Sue? While unaware at the start of the films, Sansnips is in fact the Goo Galaxy's first successful experiment into gifting vegetables sentience. They always knew that they didn't fit in, but... I guess they're too dense to notice that they have leaves? Sorry, not dense. Um, uh, distracted by the scars in the fabric of their trauma. I don't know. Anywho, the story begins with our grizzled... No, hang on, I've said that one before. Um, uh, our aggrieved? Decocted? Umbrageous protagonist engaged in fierce battle against the forces of ununiformity, staunchly fighting side by side, face by face, and facet by facet with the only folk they call friend. So let's meet them. Meet Kent, Brat, Chet, Bot and Ratchet, one of the many platoons comprising the Rat Regiment. When the Polytope Wars began, the rats were the first to sign up in enormous quantities. Uh, to be fair, the rats were the first to do anything in enormous quantities, that's kind of their whole thing, is enormous quantities. And cheese. This specific platoon, that of Kant, Bat, Chet, Bot and Ratchet, is one we find Sansips fighting within. Knowing one another since they were pups and a sprout, this gaggle of misfits did everything together. Well, almost everything, there's only so much ratting you can do when you're a vegetable. Still, they were close. But as close as they were to their old combat buddies, Sansnips always knew that somehow, for some reason, deep down, they didn't quite fit in. We treated to some wonderful back and forth between these characters. Kant can't see anything through their binoculars. Bat struggles to replace the batteries in their laser pickaxe. Chet tries to explain to Bot how you're supposed to eat meringues. And Ratchet, who can only communicate through squeaks, tries to explain their carefully laid out battle strategy. Great friends, the lot of them. Yeah. Shame they're all wiped out in the first five minutes, really. All kaboomed during the final life-shattering blast in the Great Battle of Gerdo, along with all other life on the planet. Bleak way to start a film, I reckon, but uh, it leaves Sansips as the sole survivor. Ooh, so brooding. Sansips soon learns that they are not alone on this war-singed husk. A poor orphan child is left wandering the fuming wastelands of a once-thriving planet. The other sole survivor, the single remaining native, without so much as the clothes on their back. They've got no home, got no family, got no possessions, got no socks. Sansip, still reeling from the loss of literally everything else, takes comfort in the presence of God No Socks. I mean, they don't show it, but they do. Taking them under their leaf, the two of them attempt to survive in the ashen wilderness as best they can. Sansips teaches God No Socks basic survival and scouting techniques, while God No Socks teaches Sansips the language and songs of their people. I mean, it's literally just them now, so I'm not sure how useful the language is going to be. And the songs are nursery rhymes. Still, having been found swaddled only in scraps of burnt cloth, clothing becomes something of an obsession much later in God No Socks' life, with discomfort a running theme, as if to remind them of what they once had, or didn't have, or lost, I guess. 
Sharp spikes, pointy helmets, long heels. Well, it's as good an excuse as any for some foreshadowing, isn't it? Abandoned on a war-torn husk of a planet, our two sole survivors had to find a way back to civilization before they befell the same fate. Or before they were eaten by the giant carnivorous snarstuck snails that were presumably the third lot of soul survivors? Fortunately, a couple of smugglers chose precisely the wrong planet to hunker down away from the law just before everything went boom, making them the fourth lot of soul survivors. Unfortunately, it's not easy to haggle your way onto the ship of the Goo Galaxy's most notorious weapon smuggler, Gun Heidi, nor indeed to get past their faithful Spidey and accomplice, Nip Dip. Self-assured and in no desire to endanger themselves further, it's a tricky task for Sans Snips and God No Socks to convince from these fugitives' asylum, but fortunately, a combination of God No Socks' extraordinary pleading eyes, Sans Snips' lethal skills to offer, and a sudden snail attack leads them all to being shuttered inside the smuggling ship's bridge anyway. Thus, an uneasy alliance is formed and we make our way to civilization. Now, as you're no doubt aware by now, and as Nip Dip's name might suggest, some design decisions were made, and the costume was ready for filming by the time the higher-ups and censors realised. Very prominent they were, they thought it was a scarf. So some very quick costume improvisations were made on the day of filming, I don't think anyone noticed. Uh, all in all, this whole nip censorship debacle seems a bit silly, really. Particularly given some of the other characters coming up. Having been detected exiting the airspace of the now all but snail lifeless planet, the smuggling ship is pursued through space in an exciting sequence that I'm very ill-equipped to show you. An attempt was made to hide in the highly populated artificial city planet of Parabolicon, but however deep they could go, they were followed, until they could run no more. It was then that their bacon, veg and or mandibles were saved by the urban warrior duo of Crab Discardo and Froggy. Having worked literally and figuratively underground for decades, these hardened, wizened warriors aid our ragtag adventurers in escape. They themselves seek the philosophy of balance and uniformity, albeit spiritually, and are delighted, well they're enthusiastically stoic to discover, that Sansnips must report to the Uniformity Council regarding the aforementioned genocide, and thus join in the endeavour. Their heroic rescue may even earn Gun Heidi and Nip Dip a pardon, giving them a reason to stay in the story. Together, this gives us our core team of goodies. The grizzled warrior, the somehow exceptional but still nonetheless a child child, the wise cracking gunslinger and their muscle, and the wise battle sages, spiritual guides. It is these that we shall follow throughout the prequel films on their journey to restore uniformity to the Goo Galaxy. I mean, it's not just them, obviously, but you know, they're the good guys. Well, they're the, they're the main ones, anyway. They're, well, they're, they're the important main ones. They're, they're the ones worth... <sighs> okay, let's talk about Tick Up and Snick Up. So, during an unscheduled visit to a swamp moon, the group stumble upon a couple of... Interesting characters. There's Tick Up, the long abandoned public information technoid whose circuits have gone a little wibbly in the swamp mists, and Snick Up, a native of the swamps who communicates almost exclusively through squelches and splat sounds. They are the. comic relief of the films, and. Uh, look, in retrospect, yes, these characters were just the worst, but in the filmmaker's defense, they were told by the studio that the films desperately needed some comic relief. You have to understand, people loved Auga. Everyone loved Auga. There was a solid decade from the mid-80s where all you would see in comic shops were figurines and plushes of Auga. Kids would be decked to the nines in plastic mouth trumpets and novelty air horns, and the studio was desperate to recapture that magic. And more importantly, money. And here we are. It didn't work. Obviously, maybe merchandising shouldn't be a deciding factor in character design, I don't know. Either way, these two are probably best left to the gutters of cinematic history. Unfortunately, they somehow managed to outlive Froggy, who sacrifices themselves at the end of the second film for dramatic effect. These guys, these guys outlive Froggy. What on earth were they thinking? Naturally, with a mysterious world like the Goo Galaxy so focused on action, exploration, and above all, imagination, the one thing this brand new prequel trilogy focused on most was, of course, politics. A good two-thirds of each film was taken up by council meetings, you know, discussing parking rates, planning permission, weekly bin collections, that sort of thing. So I thought I'd give you a quick rundown of Sansips' superiors, the Grand Council of Gloom. At the head of the spheroid table, we have Sir Hapsipaddy, the noble and wise leader of the council, whose sage wisdom has secured them the council's respect, Googalaxical power, and the iridescent Snarstux shell, which nobody prior wore as a hat, but it's that kind of thinking that gets you the top job. 
The tactical brains of the council come in the form of the lower half of Councillor Thinhead, for obvious reasons. The only former soldier on the council, Thinhead often worked as a lookout for reasons they have yet to fully comprehend. In the administrative department, we have the councillors O, Ho oh and oh ho oh the bickering gaggle of myopic bird folk who'd rather spend a week arguing over the specific placement of the urgent stamp on the very, very important time-sensitive orders rather than realise why it's there. We of course have the wise sage of prophetic and incredibly useful wisdom, that path, and the unwise sage of pathetic and incredibly contradictory wisdom, that quit path. Representing the depressurized deep ones, we have the great bottoms of the ocean moons themselves, Sidit Thickdex and Mahaini. They spend most of their allotted council time campaigning for more water in the council chambers. We naturally have Councillor Wavetoff, who's a weird light thing? I'm not sure if anyone knows if they're actually sentient, or just a strange light fixture that the handyman put in on a bank holiday weekend, but they have a cushion at the council table, so you will address them with respect. There's Stupid Hickadox, the longest standing councillor by virtue of somehow contributing less than the potential light fixture they're sat next to. That's impressive, all things considered. Not that they've ever considered anything. And to round it out, we of course have Dope. The cute little space goblin with the power to destroy a planet with a single sneeze. Not that they ever used that, of course, it would kind of ruin the stakes of the plot, that kind of power. It sort of makes you wonder why they wrote it in, really. Once you mention Chekhov's sneeze, you can't exactly leave it unsneezed, can you? I don't know, maybe in the sequel trilogy. Anyway, on to the bad guys. A guiding force of the prequels was originality. They weren't gonna sit on their laurels and rehash old ideas, no, they were coming in with hot, fresh new concepts, and the villains were no exception. Having just escaped the swamp planet, the team is confronted by the blood-draining silhouette of the cruelest and most mysterious warrior known to the Goo Galaxy, glaring down at them with a milk-curdling growl. The team, of course, knew they were facing down, or up, I guess, the petrifying form of Bad. Embittered by the devastation to local cultures wrought by the uniformization of the Council of Gloam and the loss of an arm in a freak buffet accident, Bad coalesce their hatred of the world into the physical manifestation of horns, thorns, spines, and prickles. Anywhere between three and five hundred, depending on what the prosthetics union could negotiate that day. Truly groundbreaking practical effects, in the sense that exploratory drilling was required to source that much synthetic latex. So tiring was this process that by the time they noticed that the onset fans were too powerful and the costume was elastic, no one had the energy to fix it. Anyway, having begun their campaign of ununiformity, or just eformity, starting with a mere rabble of 12 furps and 20 tridips under their banner, Bad has since amassed armies of a scale hitherto unknown to overworked CGI artists. Seriously, this guy gets a specific mention in multiple Hollywood union contracts to this day. Anywho, whomever is ignorant, foolish, deluded, or inebriated enough to face bad in one-on-one -on -one combat deserves all the puncture wounds they get. I mean, it's inevitable, really. Look at the horns. There are so many. They put anti-bird spikes on their robot arm just to rub it in. And you really don't want to rub it in. I mean, some parts of the internet might, but I don't go there. Anymore. As ruthless and capable as bad is, they can hardly lead multiple armies alone. Fortunately, assistance comes in the disparate forms of bad's right-hand man and left-hand monstrosity, irrespectively, Narshax, the great-toothed Spino-snub, and his faithful second-in-command slash Narshax handler, Stunt Deputy. Hi. Stunt Deputy High is known, outside of generally just being a swell guy, for being the only technoid in the Goo Galaxy to have A. joined the Simplex Scouts, B. completed all Simplex Scout badges, and C. done so without reprogramming or downloading new skills. They considered that cheating, and quote, not fair to the other kids. I should specify at this point that they did this at 259 years old? Stunt Deputy High is very accommodating and wears their heart on their sleeve by which I mean their sleeves are lined with interface cables for all connection types known to the Goo Galaxy. And yes, that includes all 20 types of USB? Are there really that many? Bloody hell. As such, they present themselves as either quite vulnerable or very confident. It transpires that they are in fact neither, and they are just extraordinarily naive, as they learned one day when Bad just stuck an infested dongle in there and gained a very resourceful and convivial second in command. Narshax, on the other hand, is basically just Bad's pet. Used for intimidation purposes, yes, but they're never going to get put in harm's way. They got a big fluffy bed up on the dot space station, you know, many pets, many scritches. But they're not allowed to eat prisoners anymore, unfortunately. Bad for their digestion. Now, there's no use in commanding an army if you don't have an army to command. 
It's a borderline tautological there, but you know what I mean. But, as we all know, recruiting is the slow part of building an army, so what better way to make one than cloning? But ensuring a good skeletal muscular structure is the slow part of cloning, so what better way to make a clone army than by just not caring? Just squish some meat and sinew into a trash compactor, wrap it in an aluminium can's worth of armour, give it a gun and a helmet, and you've got yourself the SPAM regiment. A uniform horde of meatheads ready to storm the Goo Galaxy headfirst. Or at least whatever mush approximates a head. Here we see the lovable platoon consisting of Grip, Grit, and Greco. Well, kind of. The thing with the Spam Regiment is their distinct lack of identity, so not even their names are their own. They acquire the name of the first thing they kill, and if they don't kill anything, well, they're not worth naming. It's a bit bleak when you put it like that. Hmm. These films were marketed to kids. Anyway, suffice it to say, the original Grip, Grit, and Greco are long dead, and these mechanically reconstituted friends are wearing the ghosts of their names. <laughs> lovable scamps. A Googleological casserole of soldiers is fine if you want to swarm a city, but sometimes you need a specific set of skills to make a specific set of kills. For this, Bad hires the terrifyingly erratic rogue technoid Yetibot Podesto, and by proxy, their child, Toybot Podesto. It is, of course, illegal under the Grand Council for a technoid to create another technoid, what with recursion and all that. This surprisingly means that Toybot is actually the most wanted being in the Goo Galaxy. This threat to their child's life led Yetibot's protective procedures to overflow, and subsequently categorised anyone following any law as a potential threat to Toybot's life, and thus to be eliminated. Bit of a leap, I reckon, but given the subsequent body count, I wouldn't be confident enough to argue against it. To pour salt into the wound, Yetibot still wears the pelt of their first kill, a Spidian, the race of Nipdip. Toybot, following suit, wears the pelt of the rat they killed within two seconds of being booted up, something that Yetibot is exceptionally proud of. This, of course, causes Nip Dip and Sansips to take an element of personal insult to their appearance, and thus maybe they start one too many fight scenes? Very well choreographed, yeah, but too many. I mean, a lot of them were supposed to be with Bad, but the stunt performer kept overheating under all the horns. I don't know how being in a big metal sphere was better, but there you go. Now, of course, we need our lovable rogues of the story. Neither good nor bad, just up to mischief. We have the out-of-touch disaster bounty hunter, Rob Destido, and their accomplice slash weapons expert slash accountant, Doheen da Tiddy. Mercenaries for hire, these two are, well, hired by the armies of Eformity, largely due to their history with Gunheidi and Nipdip, having chased them around the Goo Galaxy for longer than, well, longer than Godnosox has been alive. I mean, they're not very competent at it, and it's arguable if Gunheidi's ever actually noticed they've been doing it, but they don't give up, that's the point. Speaking of not giving up, you might notice they're not particularly spacey appearance. Uh, now, the in-universe reason for this is that Rob is the shortened version of the nickname Retro Blended, so given because they look like they've been put into a second-hand clothing shop which has itself been put into a blender. The real-life reason for this was an ill-placed costume designer strike and, well, management thought they could do the job themselves. Regardless, Doheen goes along with this as much as they go along with anything. There's a paycheck at the end of the day, although they're starting to realise how little accounting they're actually doing, which is why they were originally hired. This is ultimately the point at which they turn and join the goodies in the final climax, there's only so far you can stretch a contract. Oh, and by the way, Doheen is a goblin. I mainly point that out because, well they're quite big, and space goblins are fungal in nature, so, you know, that, that does mean they're not mammals. What's with the tits? Anywho, enough philosophizing over mushroom boobs, it's time to ask who's actually pulling the strings here. Oh yes, it's that time, but don't worry, if there's one lesson they did learn from it's that maybe they shouldn't have the big bad cause people to throw up just by being seen or mentioned. A far cry from the monstrousness of the original Goo Galaxy films, the secret machinations are this time being presumably machinated by the incandescent insectoid form of the ethereal Rhapsody. Once again, little is known about the true intentions of Rhapsody, their consciousness being on a different plane and or dimension to the other polytopes. Perhaps they desire an end to uniformity to expand the horizons of what a polytope can be capable. Perhaps they simply desire instability, for which uniformity is anathema. Perhaps they're preparing to enter a chrysalis form, and it's- oh god no, okay, maybe not that. Perhaps they were written by some very tired screenwriters who were only hired because the director of the second film was fired for on two melon farms. There may be many reasons, but it does not matter. Rhapsody is truly in charge of the direction of this universe, and they have many facets to their intentions. Which is somewhat ironic, since, you know, 
I don't have a face. Well, that's about all for the main cast, but before we wrap it up, I should probably give shout-outs to some of the background characters in the films. They may have literally been invented on the day by a panicking costume department, but that's not going to stop the fans from obsessing over each and every one of them now, is it? Oh dear. So here's a few choice picks from the corner of frame. We have the Goo Galaxy's favourite light-speed food deliverer, Pinnock. Always on time, both with your food and musically. Great jazz pianist. We've got the most prolific and salacious gossip bot this side of the Quipafix constellation, Titbit, who is incidentally a part-time idol. There's Swifty, Gwifty and Snifty, who are just some random goblin suits they had lying around in the costume department. Of course, 10 or 15 years later, they'd retcon them into being anti sendents of Biggle, Baggle and Boogle, but they're just going to do that sort of thing. We have the questionably designed line of robotic candles, the Iwax. Whoever gave them a knife deserves whatever limbs they lost in the process. There's Fry, who was just a boom operator who was accidentally in the background of one shot, but, you know, he's now got 20 pages of lore on the wiki about him and his great Gabathy fluff hammer. We have the Goo Galaxy's most charismatic and deafening glim ruck singer, Stardip, backed up by their sister and one woman choir, Sister Dip, and their sister's sister, Sister De Dip. And of course, friend to many and mischief to all, the Goo Galaxy's most spherical rascal. <laughs> No, that's their name. Ha. And that's all she wrote. And by she, I mean uh, me. The nonsense has gone on long enough and I shan't keep you, but suffice it to say, my greatest thanks are extended to my delightful patrons who enable my shenanigans in exchange for early releases, behind the sceneses, and Discord bitses and bobsles. And of course, my thanks to the people behind the Polytope wiki, without whom several long lists of very silly words wouldn't have given me an afternoon of giggling and idea smithing. If you want, you can watch the original Googleology video, or indeed anything else I've made on this channel, or on my Twitch, my Tumblr, my website, links below, etc, etc. Right, this microphone's pay as you go and I'm skin. So look after yourselves, everyone. Bye! Bad. The Polytope Wars. Wars? Where is a very wobbly war?